Subjectivity is a very important topic for the existentialists, so we'll focus mostly on subjectivity. But to understand subjectivity, we also want to understand objectivity. It's sort of a converse or it's related point. So we've talked about this, I think, briefly in lecture before, but it's been a while. I can't even remember the lecture in which we covered this. So we'll start off with objective and subjective. So we have some definitions uh, in front of us here on the screen. So something saying something is objective is saying that it's sort of independent of us in some sense. It sort of doesn't depend on us. Uh, it's distinct from us. It doesn't uh, rely on us. And then subjective is the opposite. So if something's subjective, it does depend on us in some way. Uh, it relies on us in some way. Um, so usually we use these terms to talk about things that are objectively true or things that are subjectively true. So I think the example we used earlier in a lecture was um, the earth being round or the earth being flat. Is it an objective truth or a subjective truth that the earth is round? And the thought is, well, it's objectively true. It's true regardless of us that the earth is round. So it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. Uh, the earth is round. Something that's subjectively true is something that's true or false uh, depending on us or depending on humans. And so the easiest examples of these are things that depend on individual humans. So it's sort of uh, subjectively true that there's a window to my left. Why? Because that's true for me. It depends on me. It may also be true for you. It may be false for you. It's sort of subjective to each person. And this can uh, also be subjective depending on where you are. So subjectivity kind of can vary depending on all sorts of factors about the subject, but the basic thought is if it depends on you somehow, then it's sort of a subjective truth, otherwise an objective truth. So uh, ideally what you want to do right now is pause the video and try to come up with examples of things that are objectively true and things that are examples of uh, things that are subjectively true. So I suggest pause. Um, whether or not you paused, welcome back. Uh, here's some examples. So for things that are objectively true, I have water is H2O. So the thought is, look, it doesn't matter what you do, what I do, what anybody is up to. Water is dihydrogen monoxide, and that's just something true about water. Uh, cats can sneeze. So again, the thought is, doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter what I do. Cats sneeze, and that's just a truth about the world, an objective truth about the world independent of us. Finally, the earth is round is the example we've used before. Doesn't matter what's going on in your head, doesn't matter what's going on in my head, doesn't matter what we're doing in our lives, the earth is round. Deal with it. So uh, then we have subjective truths. So samosas taste great. So the thought is this is true for me. Why? Well, this depends on something about me. It depends on me liking samosas. If I didn't like samosas, it would be false. Uh, it's totally up to me. It's also totally up to you. Notice the truth can vary between us. So if you don't like samosas and I do like samosas, it's false for you, but it's true for me. So we get different truths sort of floating around out there. That's different from what's objectively true. There's one objective truth about water or about cats or about the earth. There's not multiple truths, but there's multiple truths about samosas. Some people maybe don't like samosas out there. Uh, Modi is PM. So notice this could be different this could change not depending on votes or something of course that could change depending on votes but really if everybody wakes up tomorrow and just decides no modi is not the prime minister i don't believe that modi is the prime minister then modi is not going to be the prime minister anymore why how do we know well because look whoever we treat as the prime minister is the prime minister if people stop treating modi as the prime minister they say we're just going to ignore all the laws we're going to ignore that he won the election uh, we're not going to treat him as the PM, then he isn't going to be the PM anymore. It gets complicated. You might say, well, no, I think the PM is whoever won the election, and people can just be wrong about this. And so maybe this isn't a perfect example. We can sort of have a debate about this. Similarly, if we look at the next example, seven onions at the store cost 15 rupees. So again, the thought is, look, this depends on us. If the shopkeeper changed his mind about how much the onions cost, if I change my mind about how much the onions cost, if everybody on earth changed their mind and decided that the onions cost 10 rupees, then that's what the onions are going to cost. There's not some sort of objective truth out there about what the onions are going to cost, uh, independent of what people believe about it. And so the thought is, look, this is sort of a subjective truth. It depends on us. So that's sort of subjective truth and objective truth. 
And the basic idea is subjectivity is about what depends on us. Objectivity is about what doesn't depend on us, what's true regardless of us. And let's look at what the existentialists have to say about subjectivity. So the existentialists are very big on subjectivity. Among the sort of philosophers of subjectivity, their viewpoint is one of the most sort of subjective viewpoints that we get. Um, and uh, whether or not this is a difficulty for them, we'll have to see what they say. So let's look at Sartre, because he's the one we've read uh, so far and see what he's got to say. So we start on page 20. What do we have on page 20? Oh, so um, he, he's talking about sort of the central precept of existentialism, which is existence precedes essence. And so he's saying, what do the existentialists have in common? What they have in common is simply their belief that existence precedes essence, or if you prefer, that subjectivity must be our point of departure. What exactly do we mean by that? And then he goes on to refer to explain existence precedes essence. But notice the central key of existentialism, existence precedes essence, is can also be described as subjectivity is our point of departure. So they're just the same thing described in different ways. So subjectivity is the key to existentialism. It's the same as saying existence precedes essence. essence. Why? Well, because subjectivity sort of depends on us. It's all about us. Uh, whatever is determined by our existence is what's subjective. Whatever is not determined by us, that's objective. And so the thought is our existence precedes our essence. What we are fundamentally, what human beings essentially are, is determined by the choices that we make, by our freedom and our free choice. And so that means that subjectivity is sort of everything for human beings. When it comes to what matters, when it comes to sort of our lives and who we are, it's up to us, it's up to our freedom. Our free choices make us who we are. And so subjectivity makes us who we are. Subjectivity determines who we are and it really determines everything that matters. The only stuff that matters is what matters to us. We make the choice to make it matter to us. And so subjectivity is sort of in charge of the entire world, essentially, for the existentialists. So that's a relatively radical view. Subjectivity is sort of uh, everything for the existentialists. So what exactly do we have in mind by subjectivity or subjectivism? So we see here on page 23, Sartre says, the word subjectivism has two possible interpretations, and our opponents play with both of them at our expense. Subjectivism means, on the one hand, the freedom of the individual subject to choose what he will, and, on the other hand, man's inability to transcend human subjectivity. The fundamental meaning of existentialism resides in the latter. So you might say, oh, oh, Professor Weltman, hold on, you just explained subjectivity in the sense of the first one, the freedom of the individual subject to choose what he will. But Sartre is saying, no, that's one meaning, but there's a second meaning, man's inability to transcend human subjectivity, and that's the one that existentialism talks about. So why did you make it sound like it was the first one when Sartre is pretty clear that it's the second one? Well, what does he mean by the second one, man's inability to transcend human subjectivity? So the fundamental meaning of existentialism resides in the latter. When we say that man chooses himself, not only do we mean that each must choose himself, but also that in choosing himself, he is choosing for all men. In fact, in creating the man, each one of us, in creating the man, each of us wills ourselves to be. There is not a single one of our actions that does not at the same time create an image of man as we think he ought to be, and he goes on to explain things. This is sort of the core of existentialist morality. What Sartre is getting at in this passage, which we can look at more later in a different video or in Q&A, is that, um, existentialist choice or free choice or subjectivity is not uh, entirely unconstrained. Saying something subjective doesn't mean there's no rules. It doesn't mean anything goes. It doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. It doesn't mean nothing matters. All it means is that ultimately it's up to you. And really what it means is it's up to us. So I've been putting this in terms of you and just one person. But really, uh, if we look back at the definition of subjectivity, it depends on us. So some things depend on you, but most things depend on sort of us. They're kind of intersubjective in a way. And so for the existentialist, really everything, uh, subjectivity kind of reaches outside of you. It connects you to all other human beings. Why? Because sort of all other human beings are equally free and equally have this sort of power to determine meaning for themselves and to shape themselves. And how we're tied together and what this tie means we can talk about this more sort of in a different video. But the basic thought is that existentialist subjectivity is not a sort of isolated subjectivity. You're not alone. Uh, you're sort of together with other people.
But at the same time, I think Sartre is being a little unclear here. Although he says he doesn't mean this first thing, the freedom of the individual subject to choose what he will. Really, it is also that. Really, in a sense, you are alone. So ultimately, it is on you. You are choosing for other people simultaneously. They're also choosing for you. You have to keep their freedom in mind, things like this. But you can't escape the fact that ultimately it lands on your shoulders. Like this subjectivity is uh, something that you are in charge of. And so the existentialist doesn't want to make too much of this. People misunderstand existentialism and think it's an entirely like there's no rules or anything. It's nothing like that. There are certainly rules, and he thinks we can get rules out of subjectivity. But the basic thought is, uh, ultimately, it is up to you and up to the rest of us. Like it is, it does all depend on your choices and your freedom. So, uh, what's next? So now we'll go much later in the reading to page fifty-two. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Oh no very slightly back to 23. If I were editing these videos, I'd probably cut this out, but it's more. So 23, right before this, uh, here's an important point. Man is indeed a project that has a subjective existence, rather unlike that of a patch of moss, a spreading fungus, or a cauliflower. And you could probably go further with this. I think the subjectivity that existentialism is interested in uh, really only applies to humans for the existentialist. So the thought is, here's something special about humanity. Subjectivity is something very special. Uh, it doesn't apply to other species, to other creatures, not to moss, not to rocks. What's next? Ah, good. The only universe that exists is the human one, the universe of human subjectivity. So notice that's a very strong claim. The only thing that exists is the universe of human subjectivity. What about rocks? What about moss? What about the earth being round? What about cats sneezing? What about, what was the other example? What about water being H2O? So yeah, Sartre doesn't literally mean, yeah, Mars does not exist except insofar as it's part of human subjectivity. Cats don't sneeze unless somebody notices that I'm sneezing. He's not saying that. What he means is that, uh, you know, nothing matters except insofar as it matters to us. So anything and everything that sort of matters in the world or exists in the world in a way that is worth thinking about or talking about or caring about, all of that is sort of already filtered through human subjectivity. For something to matter in some way, it's due to somebody's free choice to make it matter. And so it's not like the existentialist denies that there's other stuff in the world, that there's objective stuff in the world. It's just that that objective stuff does not matter. There's no point in worrying about the objective stuff unless you make a choice to worry about the objective stuff, which, great, go right ahead, make choices uh, to do whatever you like. That's the existentialist point. But until you make some sort of choice with respect to that objective stuff, there's just nothing interesting to say about it. Even the choice not to make a choice about it that's a choice. So Sartre says that somewhere. So ultimately, there's something we can say about everything in terms of our choices. But the point is, it all gets filtered through, or it all depends on human subjectivity. Human subjectivity is at the root of everything that matters in the universe. Uh, the universe that exists is the human one, the universe of human subjectivity. So again, a very strong human-centered, freedom-centered, subjectivity-centered claim. And finally, to get a sort of more concrete version of this, um, bu -bu -bu. This is in um, page 68, the, um, this, this is after, by the way, the uh, reading assignment, this is the, um, the interview after it, so uh, 68 to 69, so um, Sartre is talking about things um, objectivity and conceptions of the truth, uh, sort of pre-Marxist position and things like this. Um, if you postulate a universe composed of objects, truth is eliminated. The world of the object is the world of the probable. You owe it to yourself to acknowledge that any theory, oh no, what's happening to my computer, whether scientific or philosophic, is probable. The proof of that lies in the fact that scientific and historical theses differ and always appear in the form of hypotheses. If we acknowledge that the world of the object, the world of the probable, is unique, we will end up doing nothing but a world of probabilities, and therefore, since a probability depends on a certain number of accepted truths, what is the basis of your certitude? Our subjectivism permits certitudes such that we can agree with you on the level of the probable, 
and justify the dogmatism that you have demonstrated during your presentation. But that does not make sense but that does not make sense in view of the position you're taking. If you don't define truth, how can you conceive of Marx's theory other than as a doctrine that appears, disappears, and changes, and whose only value is theoretical? How can one propose a dialectic theory of history if one does not begin by laying down a number of rules? When we find them in the Cartesian cogito, we find them only by situating our discussion on the plane of subjectivity. We have discussed the fact that men constantly treat men as an object, but reciprocally, in order to fully understand the object as such, we need a subject that can be realized as a subject. So the thought is uh, the project of science, really the project of anything, whatever sort of objective rules or hypotheses or uh, explanations you set up, all of that is going to depend, to depend on situating our discussion on a plane of subjectivity. This is always going to be a subjective project fundamentally. This is the plane on which all things, including science and scientific inquiry, are going to sit. So one common response to sort of everything subjective views like existentialism is no science can save us science can show us objective truths and the thought Sartre is discussing here is no for any of this to get going for any sort of scientific truths to be built out of anything it's going to be built on a plane of subjectivity so this is uh, kind of the central claim of existentialism it's one of the most radical claims of existentialism and uh, that's it <laughs>